Hello everybody, like uh, Kyle already said, my name is Rachel, welcome. This is my talk about uh, going full stack with GraphQL. So a little bit about myself, I work at uh, Open Value Utrecht in the Netherlands. I'm currently uh, working as a developer at Rabobank. Uh, unfortunately no GraphQL for me over there, but in the last years I've done some several projects uh, with GraphQL and today I'm going to share with you guys um, the fun stuff and hopefully you get as excited as I am about this technology. So, GraphQL. So first, small introduction for the people who have never seen it before. And for that, we're going to look at their website. And basically, GraphQL is a query language which um, lets you describe the data, as demonstrated. And the client can uh, get exactly the data shape that he wants. So, you get predictable results. I think that's uh, like the, the thing people know about GraphQL when they hear it. But there's way more of, of, uh, of that, of course. And I like this example. You can see in real time people adding the client responses or their requests. And you see the response change uh, accordingly. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of GraphQL is, of course, when you uh, are going to batch a lot of resources in one go. And that's usually also the selling point that they, uh, when, when people talk about GraphQL, right? So instead of having all these separate requests, like in parallel and sequential, whatever, uh, in GraphQL you can just do it in one batch. And that's also what we're going to uh, look at today, how to do make a cool uh, GraphQL schema and utilize these functions in, um, in, in GraphQL itself. And before we dive into it, I want to show you the last part here. And where you can see how the left side, which is a client from our query, corresponds to the type definition that lives in the server. And what we can see here is that on the root level, you have a resource. And every time you do an indentation, you basically go to a different resource. So here you can see that a hero has friends. And from those friends, we want to know the name. But a friend also has a home world, which is a, a yet again another resource. And that's okay, how you can see how multiple resources are combined into one request. So, how does this compare to REST? Like many of you probably will be using REST, and here that's uh, the standard. Well, GraphQL changes quite a bit when uh, look comparing it to REST. Uh, as we know, REST has many endpoints, it's a resource based. So you have your items, uh, you have your items slash an ID for a get by ID, etc. Well, GraphQL only has one endpoint because the query language determines what the data shape will be. Um, besides that, in REST we also have the full resources. So when I request a resource, I get everything uh, regarding that resource, also the stuff I didn't ask for. And opposed to GraphQL, we can prevent overfetching by requesting exactly what we need, like we saw in the example of the web in the website. Furthermore, we're used to work with uh, status codes, like uh, 400 bad requests, 404 not found, etc. Like really gives you the information you need to understand what goes wrong in the request or what's happening. Well, we kind of also lose that information because you only have one endpoint. There might be multiple resources in your query. So a 404 doesn't cut it anymore. Um, so it's either a 200 or something really goes bad. That's, that's basically what happens in GraphQL. And for the last point, in REST you can do versioning, like putting it in your header, putting it in your URL, whatever. And in GraphQL, there is no versioning. You support one schema for all your clients, and the data shape should provide all the, the, yeah, the, the, the requirements of your client. So for this talk, I have this uh, small example. Uh, I created a small app for a web shop. And to the left, we can see our data model. And in our data model, it's a very simple one. You know, we have some item which we can sell. And we have a review that belongs to the item. So an item can have several reviews, obviously, like your webshop does. And we also have a user. And this user can either be the seller of the item or the author of the review. And this is a very simple diagram, as you can see, and nicely distinguishable by the colors. And if we compare that to the actual GraphQL definition you write for this, you see there's quite a big overlap with how you would define it anyways, right? So in our item, we can see our fields corresponding to the blue. 
We also have some uh, external fields, but you can just define them the way they are, like an average rating, which is a number, and the reviews, uh, which is kind of the reference to the other type. And what I found confusing in the beginning when I looked at this was what are those exclamation marks, right? And basically, an exclamation mark tells you that this, res this value cannot be zero, uh, null. And this means that a graphical server will also fail if you have declared an exclamation mark and runtime the, a null value would pass, it will fail. And the most confusing one is this one because we have two nested uh, exclamation marks basically. And basically what this states is that we have a collection which cannot be null because of the last exclamation mark. But inside we have another exclamation mark basically stating that the resources in this collection can also not be null, right? So you cannot have a null at your first index or whatever. And uh, for the rest, it's uh, pretty straightforward, as you can see. We just use some primitives, not that really exciting stuff, and some references to other uh, data types. What is unique uh, uh, for this uh, definition here is the type query, which is a reserve type by GraphQL itself. And like I mentioned, you only have one endpoint, you only have one schema, but I cannot just request anything from my schema. I need some entry points. And the queries are basically your entry points. So even though I state you don't have endpoints, your query kind of serves as a sort of an endpoint within the GraphQL syntax. So if we analyze this query that's defined over here, we have an item by ID. The ID is mandatory, which means I cannot just leave it out. And I return an item, which doesn't have an, have an exclamation mark, which suggests it can also be null. And that's exactly what we want. So you might be thinking, okay, the, the schema this looks pretty straightforward, but how does GraphQL really work? Well, you have your type definition, which is set, and each time a client query comes in, we have to resolve the data that belongs to uh, what that the client has been requesting. And that's, how, well, that's what they call uh, resolvers in GraphQL, and we have two types of uh, resolvers, and for this one I'm gonna start with the query resolver, which is basically a representation of the type query in the schema. And as you can see over here, we have uh, the item by ID example. And basically what happens when this comes in, the query resolver, the item query resolver gets triggered and it will just get the data from the service. So in my case, it's, uh, it's like a Java service in your, in your boot, the Spring Boot application. Um, it can also be uh, an HTTP call to a different system, it can be gRPC, it doesn't really matter uh, because GraphQL just tells you how to uh, translates the query language into a function for you to fill in. And this is also why GraphQL is such a good middleware as well, so you can just put it in the middle of any system you like because you you're in charge of where to get the data from. So we request an item by ID we return the item from our service or wherever it comes from. And now basically we're not done yet, right? Because if you have an endpoint for an item, you have a service, you basically only resolve the fields that really belong to the item. So if I look at this example, the average rating will not be in there. The reviews will also not be in there. And the seller as well, those are different entities, different endpoints, different systems, whatever. So what happens next? Well, before we go to the next part, I'm going to show you a little piece of code of how this will look in Node, in uh, TypeScript. Um, the reason I picked this one is because Node is by far currently the biggest ecosystem for GraphQL. You can implement it in basically any language. Uh, I've worked on a project where they did it in Go. Uh, people have done it in Java. If you go to the website, you see a whole wide list of all the languages you might like. But by far, Node is mostly supported, most ecosystem, community, etc. Um, so what do you see on the screen? We have an object definition with a query in there. And this is basically an object where, which will contain all the resolvers. So you can see over here, we have our query and our item. And this is an asynchronous function. For the people who don't understand TypeScript or JavaScript, this just means it will be asynchronous. <laughs> Pretty obvious. But let's first look at the arguments of this method. Uh, 
So the first argument we're going to skip for now. That's basically the object that has been resolved so far, right? So now we are at the query level. That means nothing has been resolved. It's the root level. It will be empty. So we don't have to look at it. The second argument is basically an object containing all the variables that you put in your query. So in this case, it's an object with an ID in there because we're doing an item by ID request. Well, the third one is uh, the context object in Node implementation, Apollo implementation. And it's, yeah, it's basically something you instantiate yourself. You can see it as a poor man's dependency injection. Uh, so in other languages, you, you will probably have different ways of doing this. So in the boot implementation, you will be auto-wiring dependencies as you, as you would. But this is JavaScript, so it's slightly different. And the la last one is just an advanced object with some additional information about your query, about the context of the client query, etc., which you usually want to stay away from unless you really do some, want to do something advanced. And then basically, we resolve the item by doing an asynchronous call to our service. We get the item, and then we can transform it into a different shape if we want to, or just return null. And this is basically it. So depending on your language, the only thing you're implementing on the backend side is uh, our uh, resolvers. So how does this item type get resolved? That's up to the developer. Then we kick in into the second part, because I demonstrated in the previous diagram, we're missing information, right? The average rating, the reviews, the seller, they're all not there. So what happens next? Well, we get to the type resolver. So the item query resolver has resolved a big chunk of the item so far. And since it was not so enough, GraphQL will look for the resolving of the actual type itself. So this is not a query resolver, this is a type resolver and in more particular, the item resolver. And then the same trick applies. We are going to calculate the average rating from the review service via HTTP, gRPC, it's locally, doesn't matter. We are going to do an uh, item by ID um, from the review, so give me all the reviews belonging to this item. And we can get the user from the user service, whatever, where it's coming from. It's all in parallel. These fields are resolved in parallel. We get the response. There we go. So how does that look? Well, the query resolver really translates to the, uh, the keys, the fields defined in your query type. While the item resolver has the same function for the item. So I can, each field of my item type, I can resolve separately. And it's all optional. So I don't have to make a resolver for the ID, the name, etc., because we already have that stuff. But what we're interested in is for the average rating, the reviews, and the seller. And it's more or less the same as we just, uh, just uh, saw. Except for that this time, the first argument is used to read out the ID of the item, because this is the item that has been resolved by a query resolver beforehand. And now, basically, I have all the me means to resolve all the information uh, I need for an item. So if you look at it, um, from the GraphQL side, the item, the query resolver will be called, and then it will evaluate if all the fields are uh, resolved, and if not, it will fall back on the type resolver of the type you are requesting. And then it will do the same trick over and over again, up until it has all the data. So for the people who have been uh, paying a little bit of attention, review is also a separate type. So you can imagine that if I'm going to request an item by ID with its reviews and also some information of the review, we also have to get uh, resolve that. So if I want to know the author of a review, this is not where it ends. We go another step, step further because our item resolver has returned the reviews, but each review needs an author. And this is the, the trick you will be repeating over and over in the backend implementation of, of GraphQL. And that's what we see here, the review as an author. And by setting it up in the, such a way, the client can ask any shape at once, and GraphQL will make sure that the correct resolvers are called or not. So GraphQL makes sure that you're not computing if not necessary. You can imagine that um, a setup like this can be very performance heavy, right? So if I'm going to request for an item which has 200 reviews, let's say we're going to fetch them all in one go. And 
in this setup, this means that if I receive my item, which is one, one uh, action, let's say uh, like one service call, but then if I'm going to ask for one review 200 times, because of 200 reviews from a service, you can imagine that's performance heavy. And especially if it's a middleware solution where you're going to fire 200 requests instead of uh, 200 local calls for a review. And to fix that, Facebook created a package called Data Loader, which is the biggest performance enhancement you can do on the backend. And basically what it does, it helps you by um, calling the Data Loader instance instead of your actual service. So what happens is instead of calling my review service or backend 200 times, I'm going to call my Data Loader for that user 200 times. And basically what it does, it will catch all those 200 requests give you an opportunity to implement a batch method and then return the items back to the resolvers. And it looks a little bit like this. So I can instantiate a data loader. Uh, it just receives a function which receives all the arguments. And since we're doing a get by ID, it's only a string array. So it's not that big, not that complicated. And then I'm going to do a get by IDs, plural. So basically, I'm batching now. This would, be, this would be one HTTP request if this is a middleware solution instead of 200. And it's a good practice to just make sure that all your calls in the back are using data loader so you can optimize regardless of the size that people are requesting. So that was uh, basically the back-end part. Um, let's talk about more about the front-end and tooling around it. And one of the coolest tools, I think personally, is the GraphQL code generator. And this is really, was for me personally, the game changer for loving GraphQL and working full stack with it. So basically what GraphQL code generator does, as you would guess, it generates code. But it does that by inspecting the type definition that you created and then create, based on plugins, all this type safe code for your front end and back end. So in this, situ in this case, we're not going to go through fu fully, but basically what I configured in a YAML file over here is that I inspect my schema and it's going to generate for me all the types available in my schema. So my GraphQL item over here is a representation of the exact type definition. So my front ends are now strongly coupled with the schema. So you can imagine that if I am going to change my schema, which you shouldn't do, uh, with breaking changes at least. If I would uh, throw this th uh, through my pipeline and my, pipe my clients are rebuilding and regenerating, you'll see that they won't compile. So the build step will fail if your contracts are changed between clients or are not compatible with your client. And this is what I love about this stack is the strong coupling at compile time. But that's not all. So up until now, we have only talked about how to do this very simple data model from REST, how to transfer that to GraphQL is not really exciting. So now we are going to look into how to really improve the schema and have a professional GraphQL schema, which helps your clients and end users to understand the, uh, the, the acceptance criteria of, of the schema more, more properly. And as a simple start, we're going to implement pagination. Because um, the example I gave you before, 200 reviews of an item is unacceptable. So the first thing you would think is like, we need some uh, pagination for this. And it's pretty simple, actually. So to the left, we can see that we made an extension on the, of an update for the reviews. So instead of just asking for reviews, I'm going to add some parameters in line in the type. This just means that now every time if I'm going to request reviews in an item, I have to specify these arguments, which is the page and the size of the page. And I'm going to return an object uh, which has the reviews in there. It has some paging information and some information about how many pages there are, how many elements there are in total. And if you look at the right, we can see that our um, query looks a little bit like this. So I want to have the reviews, the first 10 reviews basically, right? Page zero, size 10. And now I have the first performance optimization in the client. Because 
thing I haven't mentioned yet, maybe you have noticed uh, by now, the performance uh, responsibility is, doesn't lie in the fully in the back anymore. It's now spread out over the whole stack because the backend can only optimize so much if you give this flexibility to your clients, right? So the clients are now in charge of not making any stupid queries. So if they say this query doesn't perform, the backend can look at it and say either like, okay, we can optimize this or you have to change your front end because there's not much we can do with this flexibility. And pagination is one of those examples of front end optimization, which is in general with, uh, without GraphQL also a normal thing to do. Let's talk a little bit about union types. Um, union types, I think, is a very cool feature in the GraphQL query language because it allows you to um, create several potential responses, uh, data, data shape responses. So this is a real life example. In my project, I've worked for a web shop before and they had the situation that sometimes the assortment changed, right? You have an item and this item is not uh, part of the store anymore. But it's not a normal not found because it used to exist and it's actually replaced by a different item. So instead of just giving back 404, I don't know what this is, we have the requirement that people book, that bookmark this page, if they go to it, they see there's a replacement. So how can you solve that in GraphQL? Well, I can use a union type and I make a union type called item result. That's what I'm going to return if you ask me for an item. And it will be either an item, which you already have seen, or it will be a replaced item, which is a new type I've defined, which is, has an ID, a reason of replacement, and an actual replacement, which is the new item. So now my, query, my client can ask, give me the item by ID. If it's an item, and you can see those three dots, which is a fragment syntax in GraphQL, you say, I want this subset for an item. But if it's a replaced item, I want this information. And together with TypeScript, this is a very strong coupled uh, situation because TypeScript is smart enough to understand, and we can see that in the um, soon in the response, the difference between the two. So if TypeScript detects this is an item based on the type name you can see over here, it will automatically cast for you and have a strong, uh, strong coupling which makes your front ends more robust if they're using TypeScript, obviously. So how does it look in the back? Well, the backend also needs to resolve a union and pretty much it's a very simple function that allows you to determine what the runtime object is, right? The GraphQL cannot detect this for you. So what we do here, we have an item resolve. It has a reserved keyword resolve type function. It gets the runtime object. And basically this is a very simplistic check but if, I'm go if there's a replacement key, then it's a replace item. And if it has a name key, it's an item. So you can make this as complex as you want, as simple as you want. For this example, it's just very simple. So that's where you build in the runtime check by the backend and GraphQL will take care of the rest for you. So from the client perspective, you'll see this. Either we have an item result containing the item IDs we requested with the type name item or we get the item result for a replaced item in this shape with this type name, replaced item. And this is what I mentioned um, by the strong coupling. TypeScript is smart enough to understand the difference between a string literal and a string. So a string can be any piece of text, but a string literal is actually the string value itself as a type. And because a TypeScript generation understands that an item is a type name and replaced item is also a type name. If it detects one or the other, it automatically understands what you're working with. So how does that look in the front end? So I created this little example in React and basically this, this component is a representation of the item result. So if I bind an item result to this component, Basically, we only have to build a switch of type name. If it's an item, this is all autocomplete because like I mentioned, TypeScript is very smart. I can just bind the result as an item to my item component. And if it's a replaced item, I can read out the reason and replacement and show a notification with the reason of replacement and pass the replacement to the item component instead. And you see zero casting, zero type checking. 
because the string literal trick I just explained. So you get pretty clean code. So next topic is error handling. I already mentioned you don't have your status codes anymore. So we're missing that, that fe key feature in HTTP. So how do we deal with this? Well, one way of dealing with it is by extending your schema with functional errors. And what I mean by functional errors are the errors that you expect, the errors that are part of your acceptance criteria of the thing you're building. I'm not talking about internal server error, bad gateway, all the circumstantial stuff that goes wrong. That's technical errors. I'm talking about functional errors. It's, for example, a not found. If I'm going to request ID 200, doesn't exist, well, it's expected. You have to build something what happen, what, uh, to, to, to react on that, right? What happens? So I'm going to incorporate that situation into the schema by adding a not found type. And in this case, I just put in the ID, the not found one, not that spectacular. I'm going to extend the item result union with another type. And I'm going to add an exclamation mark to my return result. Because now, null is not an option anymore. Because I covered all my cases. It's either an item, it's replaced, or it's not found at all. Those are the three, I the, the three cases I support. And this is also what I like about the GraphQL. If you put in your schema, uh, write your schema uh, in a proper way, if, you're, uh, if you hire a new developer who understands GraphQL, if he looks at the schema, he understands like, okay, an item can either exist, it doesn't exist, or you guys, you guys also support replacements because it's very explicit for your clients when they read the schema. And adding these things to the union, union is also very uh, easy for, uh, the re for the clients to support. They only have to add the fragment over here stating that if it's not found, just give me the ID. Fine. And also in the component, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. So we already had the switch case. Uh, with an item or a replace item. And since we just added a new case to the union, the front end can also just add a new case and show a not found component or something similar. And that's what uh, I wanted to s talk about today, about how the cool graphical schema. So I'm curious, uh, any questions? Yes, there are. <coughs> oh. So uh, one question is, um, you can secure REST endpoints. How does that work with uh, GraphQL? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, just like any other endpoint, you can also secure your GraphQL endpoint, of course. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated if you want to have some authorization differences between users and endpoints. Um, you could host multiple endpoints with the, the, for the schema and have multiple schemas, uh, basically. But usually it's a good idea to have, to have just one single source of truth schema, uh, one endpoint. But there is some flexibility in the setup and you can make it as complicated as you want yourself. Okay. Yeah. Another question is, um, how about uh, caching with REST versus GraphQL? Uh, isn't it harder with GraphQL? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, because uh, I, I, I couldn't touch on it uh, to, tonight, but the front-end tooling around GraphQL ecosystem, like Apollo Client, it basically automatically caches everything for you, and you have to manually tell it not to cache certain things. But this is really client-side caching, right? So on the back-end, I can imagine uh, having some problems uh, with the caching on the gateway layer, because you only have one endpoint. It's very hard to cache those kind of things. But to give an idea, uh, at the strategy we used uh, in our microservice architecture back then, we put the caching layer and responsibility behind the gateway. So GraphQL itself will not do any HTTP caching, but it's the services behind it who are doing proper caching. So the gateway itself, GraphQL, doesn't, um, doesn't do anything with it. And that's also a very important thing to note. GraphQL is just a gateway, like uh, an aggregator of resources. You should not be uh, building in authentication. Your backend system should be secure. And GraphQL is just in front of it, basically. And also caching the same, same, same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. What would you see as improvements for future versions of GraphQL? 
Or would you say it's up to the tooling to make it even more useful, handier to use? Um, well, so that's an interesting question. Um, the funny thing is uh, about GraphQL uh, itself, the, the query language is pretty robust, but the tooling around it is really shifting like constantly. So um, my friend Uri uh, makes, uh, it seems like he makes a new tool every week. So they created uh, tooling that automatically uh, changes REST into GraphQL and, and the other way around. So the ecosystem is really, really evolving constantly. And you have so many uh, people jumping on the GraphQL bandwagon. So I think in terms of tooling, there is no issue that there is too, mu too much tooling in my, in my opinion even. But the language itself, um, not really. I, I do, they, they, they don't support any inheritance in the schema. That's probably done uh, by, uh, with a conscious decision. But sometimes uh, you have to duplicate a lot of things in the schema which you want to have consistent, but it's not possible. But I wouldn't uh, complain to the developers about it. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's an answer that uh, that was shootable because we get uh, thanks, uh, Rachel, uh, from uh, from the the one who made the, who did the question. Ah, um, another you. question: uh, What about mutations? Are you using query and mutation? Um, yes. Um, yeah, mutations are pretty much um, you, you. You kind of define them almost the same way as you do with queries except for uh, it's, it's of course uh, resolved in a way different way. Um, so the, the difference, well, in the back you don't really have that, 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 that big important uh, distinguish with the query resolving, but in the front end it can be quite uh, complex to use mutations. Because like I mentioned before, a lot of tooling does caching and makes sure that your data uh, is limited, the, the amount of uh, data fetching from the server. But mutations make it very hard because if you do a mutation, you probably have changed stuff in the back end. And if the, everything is cached in the front, um, you have to manually start uh, whitelisting pieces of data that also have to be retrieved again, which pulls a little bit more complexity to the front end, uh, um, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Um, well, I hope so, and uh, I, think, <laughs> I uh, hope so too. <laughs> I think they can find you if uh, if not. Yeah, they can find me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't talk about mutations in this uh, in this limited version of the presentation. Okay. Um, you have to you have to subscribe for the full one hour version. Okay. Well, I get a uh, thanks, uh, Rachel, back from the <laughs> <laughs> from the one who uh, asked the question, so uh, it's fine, I think. Um, let's see if there are any more questions. There is a short uh, delay uh, of course so we'll wait for a couple of uh, of moments and if not then i would say uh, many thanks yeah. for for your talk